Today on Heavenly Eating. Frank plants a tree. Max eats some cake. Today we're gonna be talking with Steve and figuring out how he just runs this organic orchard, newly planted, right in the great area of upstate New York. We're putting these trees in and then there's gonna be a bunch of weeds that come up in here. Yeah. And dealing with the weeds is the most difficult part of having an organic orchard. Like the pests. Yeah. Cause you don't spray anymore. Uh, yeah, the, well we, I mean we spray some stuff but like it's organic, you know if there's pests we, you know there's certain organic controls you have on them. But with the weeds there are no, you know, like there's no roundup for organic totally. management. And so dealing with the weeds in an organic orchard is by far the hardest. Is there, part do you spray it. anything? Is there any kind of like? No, and so what this is, it's oats and peas. Huh. So we'll plant the oats and the peas in here and then they'll take off really quick and hopefully they'll sort of suppress a lot of the other weeds that we grow in here. Can you just keep the oats and the peas trimmed down or you just take that? Eventually we'll mow it down, but it's a, in the end, it's gonna be a lot easier to get rid of the oats and peas than to get rid of grass yeah. that might come in. A couple important things about how you place the tree. This is the graft union here. Mm -hmm. This is the rootstock, this is the scion. Yeah. And it's been grafted and so it has this like curve here. Uh -huh. The wind comes from the west. If the tree were this way, it would break. Right. So we align it this way. So it can grow like So Ellen is stuff. doing that when she places the tree. Um, and then of course depth. So I'm going to face that west. It's going to go about 18 inches from this flag to keep it in line. These trees are going to get trellis like those ones. Yeah. So they need to be in a straight line. Gotcha. And actually, it looks like a little space for these right Okay, these don't have a lot of lower roots, so we're just gonna sort of fill about halfway, and we're gonna take those clumps out. These are quack grass roots, they're off the stuff. Oh, those see are the worst. That's good, and now I'm gonna do shake to try to get the air out again, let it settle. That's it. Mycorrhiza. Yeah, mycorrhizal fungi. Yeah. Mycorrhizal fungi. So it's a fungus that has a um, symbiotic relationship with the tree. The fungus lives on the roots of the tree. Whoa. And it fixes nitrogen in the tree out of the soil, so into a form that the tree can take up. And it, in return, I think it gets like some sugars that get Oh no! I'm ready for square dancing. I'm not very good at dancing. It never was. Fine. No, I should have mixed it up first. So what we what we just saw today, um, if we were like to rip your voice out right here and talk and then put your voice over it. How would you describe what we did today? We, you had a bucket that you had some plants that you bought that, I don't know, did you graft them yourselves? Did you buy them grafts? And yeah, th those did you ones- you buy them locally? And those ones I bought grafted, yeah. They're from, they're from a nursery about an hour and a half north of here. And um, uh, yeah, so what you do when you order trees like that is uh, you work with a nursery and you have them graft trees for you. I, I graft some of my own trees, but growing, you know, a thousand trees is not something that I want to do in a nursery, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so I have those custom made for me. I do have, you know, hundreds of trees that I've grafted and grown, but not thousands. And so those trees were grafted in a nursery where, you know, they have one tree every foot and they grow them up, you know, four or five feet in one year. And so you order those, if I ordered them this year, they would bud them this year, you know, graft them this year, they would grow them out next year, and I would buy them in 2018. Okay. And so those trees, you know. So it's a year turnaround. So you, you, you tell them what kind of. It's a year and a half to two year I want Macintosh, turnaround. I want green, whatever. Right. If you're buying Macintosh apples, you can probably buy them whenever you want. 
but these varieties are relatively scarce uh -huh. and uncommon and so if you want a lot of those varieties you have to order them ahead so of what time. are the ones to talk where, about yeah where i see it going in the next few years is just making more and better cider i mean because the the best cider is made from trees that not only are really interesting genetically like they have they're either a tree that you chose the variety because it's a really good cider apple. Just like wine is made from very specific varieties, cider is made from very specific varieties. So you're not going to take a table grape and make good wine out of it. And you're not going to take regular dessert apples like you see at the grocery store and make good cider out of that. So you need the right varieties and that's why you know we plant our own orchards. But then you can also find wild fruit that has really interesting and really good properties for it. Typical process. I've, I've one cider that is made from a single variety and it's actually even only one single tree. And it, which is, is really rare, but it's because I found this tree that it's got to be a hundred years old. Wow. It's, a, it's in a beautiful location. Yeah, it'd be awesome That's to go up there and crazy. check it out. It is. It's on this farm that was built in, uh, the, the farmhouse was built in 1865. So I don't know how much before that they were farming it. And nobody knows exactly what the variety is, but it's a really good cider apple. And I recognize that by the flavor. Like it, in order to have a balanced cider, you need acid, you need tannins, and then you need sugar and I could taste in that apple that it had all those properties. And so I fermented it all by itself and it turned out great. And so now it's kind of a pet project I do every time that tree has fruit on it, is I'll press that all by itself cool. into a cider and make it. And I only got about nine cases of it, but still it's nine cases of cider. Yeah, that, that, that's you know, nice. The level is, is starting to pay attention to that is in terms of what, what flavors you can create in the future that you have to bottle now in a way that's imbalanced right now. Yeah. But 10 years down the road is going to be amazing. So and that's totally uncharted waters. You, you, for you're talking right about now. like fermentation and... No, I mean uh, just maturation in the bottle, you know, because the fermentations, those are always done in less than six months, you know. Mm -hmm. Some of so, them are done um, like champagne, right? You, like the, you said ma mm -hmm. matura right bottle. Mm -hmm. maturation. Maturation? Yeah. What is that? That maturation uh, happens, I mean, it happens on a bulk scale just in barrels. You know, you'll make your cider and either ferment it in the barrel or ferment it in a big stainless steel tank. And then eventually you let it sit for anywhere from a couple months to a year. And what happens, the maturation that happens is as it, it, it sits, there's chemical reactions that happen the, and there's also just physical settling, you know, the, the yeast that's still in solution will slowly settle out. You'll have chemical reactions that take place either between the yeast and the liquid or just stuff that's in the liquid, which in general, I mean, the flavors change, the, um, but also it gets much more clear, the clarity increases. And so that also happens in bottles. So you have to let it mature before you bottle it, but then once you bottle it, it also goes through a change, and that's where, you know, we're talking about the ageability of something. Um, once you bottle it, it will improve for a certain period of time, and then it'll plateau and stay that good. And then at some point, it might, you know, it, it will decrease in, in quality. But nobody knows, um, you know, you can't really say, oh yeah, cider, you should drink fresh. Or, you know, like beer, you know, I was just talking to someone down at the beer company and they're talking about getting their beers in like less than two weeks, it'll be on a shelf. You know, like from the time they bottle it to the time it's on a shelf for sale. And that's like crazy for cider. We don't want, like I wouldn't want anything of mine on the shelf for like a month. Yeah, that there are, just like in the wine world, you've got wine coolers and you have fine wine. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, there's like a huge range. And where I'm at is like, I, I'm aligned more with the fine wine producers gotcha. because the way I make my cider is exactly how that wine is produced. Gotcha. You know, we have plants that are in the ground that are very specific varieties or we have, you know, fortunately around here we even have wild apples, which is crazy. I mean, there's parts of Europe, I think, where you have wild vinifera vines, but it's, you know, really uncommon. Yeah. But that's, you know, that's where all of our agricultural stock came from 
was from wild plants that we domesticated and then they can revert back into wild plants and so that's what happened around here people brought apples here when they settled the area they planted them and then those apple seeds made it back out into the environment into open fields and hedgerows and grew and so they're reverting back to more of a wild apple so if you take if you take a Macintosh apple for example and plant all the seeds from a Macintosh apple not one of those seeds will be a Macintosh every seed will be a new variety so what we have around here with the wild apples is all this genetic diversity of wild you know wild apple fruit where every tree is a unique variety and so you've got all this really interesting uh, genetic material a lot of this interesting flavor you know stuff that's really tart or really astringent really tannic just very different than typical eating fruit even if its parents or its grandparents were say a Macintosh or Golden Delicious or you know something like that and so um, you know to bring it back around that tangent went off when we were talking about how fine wine is produced you've got certain varieties of grapes whether it's uh, you know Pinot Noir or Riesling that you plant this variety because you know it's going to give you a certain flavor and you know generally what kind of soils it wants to be on and everything so and you take that and then your goal is to take that plant and and juice it and ferment it and put it in a bottle so that someone can drink it and be like yes that tastes like a great Riesling or yes that tastes like a great Pinot Noir you know and so what you want to do is you want to take the flavor from that fruit and present that in a bottle and so that's what we try and do even if even if our ciders are blends we're using those varieties you know whether it's Dabinet and Chisel Jersey and Golden Russet you know each one of those apples will lend a different aspect of structure or flavor to the cider but your aim is to take those flavors from the fruit and have them presented in the cider. Is so you do it differently than everyone else. Like I haven't really met anyone else who's like, I'm gonna take over your backyard orchard or these few beautiful trees I will manage and maintenance. How do you deal with all like cause it's a labor of love and not every tree's gonna make take two years for a tree then to just pop. And then to then you're pruning, you're taking care of it, you're feeding it. Like how do you deal with all those aspects and manage and budget your time because you're kind of you know it's you and two three other people you know and you have over here one you got one over there how do you know how do you balance all these gardens i don't know man it's a juggling act yeah i would assume yeah there's just certain times of year that you do certain kinds of work like the pruning you know happens in the winter and so i never get to every i never get to every location you know that I would like to take care of um, some trees I, I prune and then might not prune it again ever some trees I'll go and hit and try and prune every year um, sometimes it just depends where I am you know I, li I like usually keep my tools in my truck and if I have a half hour and I'm you know near this one tree I'll just pull over and take care of it definitely dozens less than a hundred but more than Maybe somewhere more than between 30. 50 to 100 would you say probably bar ballpark 50 locations so how much yeah. uh, cider do you produce annually or biannually um right well last year i should say 2014 was a really light crop and it's because of an echo from 2012 where we had a really bad frost event things flowered early got frosted in mid to late april and so then that hap that throws everything into an every other year cycle. So in 2014, I was able to produce around 1,200 gallons of cider. But then this year was a huge bumper crop. I produced more like 3,500 gallons of cider. Mm. And so this year, nobody knows yet, but it's it's going to be a pretty light year. So cool. Hard to say. Thanks. So I I think that. What we can take away from this whole experience is that the life cycle is always changing and evolving. And with Farm to Table, we always have to take note of what season's going on and how we need to uh, eat and look at different things for our meals. Totally, and what Steve's doing best down here at South Hill Cider is he is doing it organically. 
he's feeding into the life cycle of food and farming. As you can see, the apple trees are beginning to bud, soon to be apples, then will be pressed, and then will become cider. This is all part of the importance of sustainability and farm to table.